So now we're going to take a look at some quantitative data. And what I have here is some data in Excel that we're going to prepare for use in our statistical software. So um, I'm going to refer back to some of the features of quantitative data that was discussed in the previous video and sort of illustrate what that looks like here. Now, this comes from um, the teacher work sample data collected using the graph maker. And you may or may not recall um, the paper that I had let you read that I wrote with my colleagues um, examined uh, data collected through the teacher work sample. Um, and that paper used data from 2012. Uh, since that data was collected, uh, we've added some variables uh, to the data set that are going to be helpful in sort of illustrating some things here. So what we have here are just 11 variables. Um, the graph maker collects a lot more data than this, but I've sort of trimmed this down uh, for ease of explanation and ease of use. Um, and the unit of analysis is actually at the student level, right? So each record is one uh, elementary school student. Um, these are just from elementary education majors. Um, and we actually have 1,367 records in this data set. Um, which we'll explore a little bit closer when we get it into the statistical packages. But here's what we've got, right? So TCID, this is the teacher candidate ID. This is uh, a randomly assigned anonymous identifier for each of the teacher candidates that collected data during their teacher work sample. Um, and student is, of course, the anonymized student ID um, for the students that they taught. So although our unit of analysis is the individual student, we also have them sort of grouped in clusters. So these first 20 students were all taught by teacher candidate zero, whereas this next grouping of students was all taught by teacher candidate one, right? Um, then we have the grade level of the student. Um, the gender of the student, and it's simply recorded as either male, female, the ethnicity of the student. And what I've done here is I've, in Microsoft Excel, I've turned on the filter feature. And so that'll actually help us take a look. So like if we click on this pull down button, we can see that there's grades one through five and kindergarten in this data set. There's also some students, some records in which uh, the grade level is left blank. Um, and then, of course, here in gender, we've got female, male, and some blanks, right? And then ethnicity is stored as a single letter code. This is Asian, Black, non-Hispanic, Hispanic, American, Indian, or Alaskan Native, um, white, non-Hispanic, and other. And next to other on the form was was sort of noted that either the race or ethnicity was not listed or the student was multiracial. And then there's also blanks, right? So not all of the students have their ethnicity field filled out. This is the free and reduced price lunch column in which uh, if the teacher candidate entered, it says either no, they do not qualify for lunch programs or yes, they do receive either free lunch or reduced price lunch. Uh, there's also some blanks in here as not this field is not entirely filled out. SWD is student with disability. This is also a yes, no field. Um, and as you can see, especially here, teacher candidate zero didn't fill that out. So there's some blanks here. Uh, ELL, or actually that's sort of a holdover. The more uh, commonly used term now is EL for English learner. Um, ELL stands for English Language Learner. There's there's still um, many states and districts that are using the three-letter abbreviation for that. Um, but this is captured as a yes-no field. There's also some blanks there. Um, this is a field that we did not have in the 2012 data set. Um, and this is the subject that was taught for the unit. So what this 
indicates here is as, as elementary education uh, teacher candidates, we don't know that an elementary ed uh, student teacher necessarily did math or reading or, or science or right. And so we started collecting the data as to which content area the unit that they taught uh, fit into. And so we have here teacher candidates that taught language arts, mathematics, science, and social studies. Um, and then, of course, the teacher candidates have to give a pre-assessment. This is the student's pre-assessment score entered as a percent. And then this is the post-assessment score entered as a percent. So with this data set, we don't necessarily know that all of the teacher candidates had the same number of points available on their assessment or, or that it was scored on the same kind of a scale. And so what we do have though is um, in the graph maker, we have the number of points available and the number of points that the student has earned. So we have converted all the student test scores into percentages so that they're on a comparable scale. So uh, these two columns will range from zero to 100. And if we click on the downward arrow, we can sort of see, well, there's zeros and two and 2.5 and four, right? All the way up to 100. Um, so if you recall back to some of the data types that we talked about, um, the first portion of this data set uh, contains only categorical variables. Nominal variables, uh, for example, the teacher candidate ID, the student ID, gender, ethnicity, these are all nominal variables, right? Um, TCID and student, these are polytomous variables. There's many, many, many options. In fact, um, the student identifier is designed to be unique so that every record has its own, but it's still nominal. Uh, whereas ethnicity, for example, is a polytomous variable. It definitely has more than two categories, but it has a finite number of categories. Um, then we also have some dichotomous variables in here. For example, uh, gender, which is not necessarily guaranteed to be dichotomous, um, as there are more than two possible gender expressions in society. Um, in this case, it's recorded as a dichotomous variable, so there's only two options and then blanks. Um, then, of course, free and reduced price lunch is a dichotomous variable. They either qualify or they don't qualify, right? And then our final two are continuous variables. So the pre percent and the post percent are both continuous variables. Um, and it's arguable whether we call them uh, either interval scale or ratio scale. Um, this does sort of have a natural zero point where if you don't get any of the items on the assessment correct, well then clearly that's a zero. Um, but if we think about what it represents, that does not necessarily mean that the student has a complete absence of knowledge of the content taught, right? So. Uh, the the proficiency in that content. Students with a zero, there might be a great variety of knowledge on the topic. Uh, they just didn't get any of the questions correct, so their understanding doesn't sort of surpass the bottom end of the scale. And so it's probably more appropriate to, to call these test scores interval variables rather than scale variables. But what we'll see as we get into our um, statistical software is that that's sort of an academic distinction. Um, our software doesn't care whether it's interval scale or not or ratio scale. Uh, it just cares that it's a continuous variable as opposed to the categorical variables. Now, when we prepare this data for import, into our statistical software packages. Um, in Excel, this, this filter feature is actually really, really helpful, 
right? Because it helps us see the different ways that the data is entered. So if I sort of scale down here, these all look very similar. That's what we're after. So what I'm gonna do is uh, mess up one of these fields so you can see how it looks. And, and I'm just gonna enter this as a lowercase f. Right, now <clears throat> with a lowercase f, some of our statistical software will see that as something different than a capital F. And so when I click here, it doesn't show up as different in um, Excel, right? So if I were to import this into SPSS, SPS, SPSS would look at this column and think that there are actually three options there and not just two, because it would mark lowercase f and capital F as, as different values. So one of the things that is very helpful to do in Excel is to uh, find and replace. Right, so in this column, I want to make sure that they're all capitalized. Uh, so if I click at the top, it highlights the entire column, right? So I click on the, the column letter at the top, it highlights the whole column. I'm going to hold down Control H. For Windows users, it's Control H. Uh, if you use an Apple, it will be the command key, which is that, that squiggly symbol, and an H and that will open the find and replace dialog. And I wanna replace uh, lowercase f with capital F. And under this little options tab, I'm gonna tell it to match case. So now I can replace all. Note it tells me that it made one replacement. So I had actually cleaned this up all before. And so the one change that I made in order to illustrate this was the only change that was made. Um, this is important to think about how your data is collected, because if it's collected through a system that sort of standardizes the, the format of the data, then this is less of a concern. But if you have data that um, someone is typing in manually, then there's a lot of variance in the way that people enter things, right? So um, because this data came through um, an Excel spreadsheet that, that I had sort of customized, uh, I make it so that it changes the case. If the teacher candidate enters in lowercase letters, the data that I get out on the other side uses capital letters. So it, it, it sort of checks for some of those things and standardizes it so the cleanup goes a lot quicker. Uh, if you get your data out of something like Qualtrics, then you know you're going to be getting it in a very specific sort of a format, and there's less of this cleanup to do. So one of the things that I like to do is just go through and check each field to make sure that it's entered in a way that makes sense for how I want to process it later. So when I look at grade levels, there's no odd grade levels. Nobody put like two slash three because they have second graders and third graders or, or anything like that, right? This is gonna work for my software. And so I'm able to verify that. When I look at ethnicity, same deal. Those are all the categories that I had. And so I'm able to sort of check through that and make sure that everything works properly. Once I have my data set, I'll make sure that I save it in this way. And then I will be able to open this Excel file in my statistical packages. Um, now, both SPSS and SAS can work with Excel files, although SAS, it just tends to be easier working with a CSV or a comma separated values file. So I'll come up here to save as, and I'll save a copy of this. If I go here to save as type, I can choose that and select CSV. So this is a comma delimited or a comma separated values file. Um, and I'll save that. Some features in my workbook, yes. So CSV is a plain text uh, file format. And so a lot of the stuff that you do in Excel won't translate. It'll give you this kind of warning. So I'll say, yes, I do in fact want to use CSV. And this file now, the CSV, will be easier to import into SAS, and I'll show you that when we get to, to that portion. So now this file 
is ready for import into my packages, I'll make separate videos for how to bring this into SPSS and another one for how to bring it into SAS so that you can see what that looks like and refer back to the, to the video that you would like to, to use.